Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to Denver Seminary. Uh, tonight, um, this event is brought to you by the TGI, the Gospel Initiative, the Gordon Lewis Center, and the Biblical Studies Division of Densim. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, our speaker to you tonight, although most of you probably are very familiar with Dr. Michael Bird. Uh, Michael grew up in Brisbane, Australia, um, before joining the Army and serving as a paratrooper. He has as many jumps as he has books. Hold on for that. Um, he was a military intelligence operator, although I was taught that military intelligence was an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp. Uh, and he also served as a chaplain's assistant. Um, and his time in the ministry is when he came to Christ, um, even though he came from a non-Christian background. And soon after that, he felt that urge, that call to ministry. Uh, he went and did his PhD at the University of Queensland. And then Michael taught uh, New Testament in Dingwall, Scotland. Um, so if you want to know where Dingwall is, go as far as you can north of Scotland, get to the water, and turn back. And that's where Dingwall is. And, and then he joined the faculty at Ridley uh, in Melbourne, uh, not Florida, but the one in Australia uh, down under. So you'll notice that he has a kind of funny accent in a moment. And he's been teaching there uh, at Theology since 2013, uh, where he also serves as an academic dean. So he's a man of many hats. Uh, Michael describes himself as a biblical theologian who endeavors to bring together the biblical studies and systematic theology. Um, that's how he describes himself. I, I describe him like this. If C.S. Lewis was alive today, he'd be N.T. Wright. But if N.T. Wright was Australian, he'd be Michael Bird. <laughs> Michael believes that the purpose of the church is to preach, to promote, and practice the gospel story of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the author of 30 books, and I asked him, what his favorite book um, that he wrote uh, is, and it, it was a test because I wanted him to say the book that I worked on with him, but he absolutely failed. Um, he said that his favorite was the evangelical theology book. And uh, I was like, but Mike, you're not even a theologian. You're a New Testament scholar, but whatever it may be. Uh, so I, I met uh, Mike a long, long time ago when we were both young warthogs. And Mike, uh, he swaggered in to Aberdeen from Dingwall uh, like he was Hugh Jackman. And uh, he gave this presentation that was clear, comprehensive, clever, um, and cheeky. And above all that, it was Christ-centered. And I said, I don't know who this Vegemite, kangaroo-loving uh, Aussie is, but I like him. And if, if you're familiar with his work, you've seen all of those elements. in um, all of his works and his sermons and his presentations he is clear. He is comprehensive. Uh, he is clever. He's cheeky at times, uh, controversial always, almost. Um, but, but above all else, um, he is Christ-centered. And so, uh, Dr. Michael Bird, uh, come and uh, let's give him a warm Colorado welcome. I want to begin by thanking uh, the president and faculty of Denver Seminary for the invitation uh, to spend this past week at the seminary. It's been great for me. I've been treated ever so well. Uh, I, in fact, I have two friends in Australia who have uh, demons from Denver Seminary. So this is a, a place that has been certainly on my radar, and it's been great this week meeting with uh, the faculty, uh, the students. I've had such a great time, and this is more snow than I've ever seen in November than ever before. No, 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 November is not snow time in Australia. November is more like fish and chips at the beach time. So this is, a, this is a very much a unique experience for me, but I'm, I'm glad to be here, and, and thank you for those who braved the snow and have come out. Uh, tonight's topic is religious freedom in a secular age. Uh, now, when it comes to the way that Christians relate to the state, we usually take one of two options, okay? When we like the government, when we like the people who are in the White House, we tend to be like Romans 13. So when my party gets elected, I think, yes, we should be all about Romans 13. You know, we should submit to governing authorities because they are agents of God. They carry the sword. So we should, we should obey governing authorities, especially when my party's in, in power. But then when the other side gets into Congress or takes control of the Senate 
or gets the White House. Then we go to Revelation 13 and we think to ourselves, I'm living in Babylon the Great. It is ripe for judgment. It's an age of idolatry and iniquity and I long for God to burn it all down to dust. I mean, we still have the same number, the number 13, and a book that starts with R is at Romans 13 when my team's in office, but it's Revelation 13 when the other people are in office. But this, but, but this speaks to the question, how do we, as people of faith, as citizens of heaven, relate to the state? And in particular, how do we maintain our freedom to worship, to practice and promote our faith in a context where our faith may not be affirmed, where some people consider our faith, our religion, our practice to be harmful. Well, in such a context, we, we want to maintain the freedom of religion, not just ourselves, but also for others. And in the earliest days of the church, when the, when, when the church was something of a, of a rogue messianic sect, when there were persecutions against the church, you can understand why the early church was very much in favor of religious freedom. They didn't want to be attacked or persecuted because of their faith. Uh, rather, they wanted the freedom to worship according to their own conscience and not be forced to do things like participate in the civic cults or the imperial cult with the worship of the emperor. And this is why the church father, uh, Tertullian, uh, he said this. He said, we are worshippers of one God, whose existence and character nature teaches all men, at whose lightning and thunder you tremble, whose benefits minister to your happiness. You think that other gods, the others too are gods, whom we know to be devils. However, it is funda a fundamental human right, a privilege of nature, that every man should worship according to his own convictions. One man's religion neither harms nor helps another man. It is assuredly no part of religion to compel religion, to which free will and not force should lead us, the sacrificial victims even being required of a willing mind. You will render no real service to your gods by compelling us to sacrifice. For they have no desire of offerings from the unwilling, unless they are animated by a spirit of contention, which is a thing altogether undivine. So the early church was very much of the mind, according to Tertullian's example at least, of supporting religious freedom. Christians wanted religious freedom for the people of the empire until they became the empire. <laughs> Because eventually you get this marriage between the Christian church and the Roman state. Now, th th this has a, a long history. So initially, Christians are being persecuted by the, by, by the Romans you know, for, you know, for all sorts of reasons. They refuse to participate in the civil cults. Uh, they seem to be a bad influence on society. They're, they're, under, they're undermining the whole system of power, pan pantheon, politics and the like. But eventually, when we get into the Constantinian era, the, the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine, then there's this big revolution and the, the Roman Empire gradually becomes Christianized and Christian. And at that point, when Christians become effectively the chaplain to the Roman Empire, they did not remember very well this principle of religious freedom for others. And there were persecutions, there were attacks, there were discriminations against pagans, uh, against the Jews as well. There is a horrible history of anti-Semitism uh, in, in the earliest, uh, well, in, in pretty much every century of the Christian church, but particularly back then. Uh, also, with the rise of Islam, you have this confrontation between Christians and Muslims in the Middle East and North Africa and in parts of Europe, and that often doesn't go 
well. But for the most part, the West, because of its Roman influence, became heavily Christianized. And Western Europe was sort of a, a default Christian, where there are a few outlying groups, maybe some pagan Vikings to the north, but it was Christian and Christianizing. But then something happens in Western Europe. We get the Protestant Reformation beginning in the 1520s. And this creates a rupture in Western Europe between those who want to maintain the Catholic mode of worship, faith, and devotion, and those who get on this Protestant bandwagon, who follow the Martin Luther and John Calvin, all of the other magisterial reformers. And this has a big influence as well in the Church of England. Eventually, uh, the Church of England itself becomes reformed in its worship and practice. And there were lots of wars of religion fought over this, of Protestants versus Catholics, and they kind of realized this can't go on indefinitely. And this is where we get the real invention of secularism, okay, European secularism. The idea, okay, we're going to stop killing each other over religion. Uh, the prince or the king is not going to impose religion on his subjects. What he's going to do is allow people to worship however they like. If they want to be Protestant, they can be Protestant. If they want to be Catholic, they can be Catholic. And when that kind of freedom is created, then Protestants, you know, proliferate in their different ways. You get Baptist, you get Presbyterians, you get the continental reform. So you get this you know, proliferation and this diversification of all sorts of Protestant denominations throughout uh, Western Europe and then eventually into the Americas. But then on the top of that, we get some more changes. We get this intellectual movement called the Enlightenment. Now, during the Reformation, what we had is people like Martin Luther saying, look, I believe the Bible not in the guy in the pointy white hat, okay? So I don't think the Pope says is a really good reason. I'm going to put my conscience as captive to the Word of God. I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, obedient to the Word of God, and I'm going to question the Pope. But that same critical spirit that was applied to church authority was soon applied to the Bible and to the very concept of revealed religion itself. And people start to wonder, I mean, did you really get miracles happening? Do virgins having babies, floating axe heads and the like? And, and some people begin to abandon religion. You get a rise in atheism, agnosticism, or some, to, or some try to reinterpret their Christianity to fit with a more with a more enlightenment spirit. And this is where you get the rise of modernity. You get religion within the limits of re reason. So, and this is where, you know, Thomas Jefferson was getting his Bible and cutting out all the miracles. You know, I'll, I'll have religion, we'll, we'll reduce it to ethics and, and good teaching about the, the love of God and the brotherhood of man, but all that you know, resurrection, the, uh, the walking on the water, that's, that's just mythology. That's just mythology. We will dispense with that. Now, this meant you had even more diversity, not just between Catholics and Protestants, but now you had people who were deists, who said, okay, there is a God, but maybe he created the world and then just left it be. You could have Unitarians and all, and all sorts of the diversities going on in the, in the Western world. And this is why the value and the virtue of tolerance became increasingly appreciated. Okay? Because it recognized that if you don't have tolerance, you're going to have sectarian rivalries in your society. And when the American Republic was founded, they decided very quickly that they did not want to be divided by sectarian and partisan divisions. And that's why they had a separation of church and state. And they also didn't want to be like uh, Europe where there would be a, a monarch, usually a Catholic monarch, somewhat uh, pushing his own religion and agenda as you have with the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburgs in Austria. So the solution to the diversity of religion, the solution to the sectarian rivalries in society was something like secularism. You know, creating space 
for people of all faith, not discriminating against people, not kind of hunting them down and persecuting them. Now, this, this wasn't perfect. This did not happen cleanly and immediately. Certainly in the United Kingdom, the Anglican Church was definitely still in a privileged position, and the same was true in other parts of the world. But in many places, such as America, as for Australia, it was meant to be founded as a secular state. Not in the sense of the absence of God, but rather that no one vision of God or worship or how to be a Christian would be treated as the norm or the default. This is why the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is that Congress shall make no more respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There will be no state church that everyone has to enroll in. There will be no religious test for holding public office. And people will not be persecuted or discriminated against on the basis of their religion. And that brings us into the age of democracy, liberalism, and pluralism. And everything after that was fine, delightful, happy. We all hold hands around the campfire, eating s'mores, singing kumbaya. And the history of the human race after that was perfectly fine and dandy. Or so we perhaps hoped. Uh, human civilizations have not been that complex. I mean, that, we, we, were in a, we are in a liberal democracy where the idea is we all have religious freedom. But I don't know whether you've noticed about this, but religious freedom in the last uh, decade in particular has become increasingly complicated. And there are calls for religious freedom not to be scrapped or abandoned, but for it to be perhaps reduced in scope and subordinated to other rights or to other issues or other political impulses we have in our society. And these are shared, I think, between Australia and America, so they translate well. So what are the things that have potentially changed in our society, in our culture, that have led people to think, well, maybe religious freedom is not as important as people used to think it is. Or maybe religious freedom is, in, is, is good, but we've got to make sure that the expression of religion or religious ideas is not harmful. Let's have a look at some of the things which have happened. Uh, first of all, we live in an age where there is a strong belief in moral autonomy and expressive individualism. Uh, that is to say, the, the default setting is each individual should be able to pursue their own happiness, realize their own goals and wishes without being inhibited by government, let alone by anyone's religion. Now, this explains why a number of jurisdictions in the world, not just in America, but in other places too, have a, a very liberal view on things such as reproductive health. Okay? Why you have a number of jurisdictions that are legalizing certain types of drugs, you know, particularly cannabis as an example. Why a number of jurisdictions are legalizing things such as euthanasia. Okay, strong belief in bodily autonomy, I should be able to decide what happens to my body and your religion should not be uh, stopping me from realizing anything like that. Uh, and you could also play the same idea with marriage, you know, you know, love is love, I should be able to marry who I want without your religion telling me who I can love and who I can marry. So this is a strong belief in, 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 in moral and personal autonomy. The second thing we have is largely a, th a therapeutic scales for ethics. I mean, there's different ways of thinking about what is right and what is wrong. I mean, you can talk in terms of, uh, of, um, of consequences, consequential ethics, or there's deontological ethics, you think of your duties, or there's responsibilities and virtues. But increasingly, our culture is thinking right and wrong in terms of pleasure and pain. You know, if I feel pain, it must be good. If I feel pleasure, um, sorry, if I feel pain, it must be bad. Uh, if I feel pleasure, it must be good. If I feel pleasure, it's not directly hurting anyone, 
then there's no reason why I should not be allowed to do it. Again, this interfaces with the first point. But this is why the principle of perceived harm is also very important. If you say something that is even potentially harmful, if you believe something that is, that is not affirming of something or not supportive of something, that can be perceived as its own form of harm. Okay? So right and wrong is defined not by civil liberties and duties, not by responsibilities. It's now defined in terms largely of pleasure and pain. A third thing we have to wrestle with is that of the sexual revolution. Okay? Uh, in the 1960s, I, I mean, uh, the 1960s was probably the most revolutionary period in human history since the 1520s. I mean, the 1520s was where the Protestant Reformation really kicks off. The 1960s was also a huge period. Massive increases in technology. Massive changes in attitudes towards things like cohabitation. You've got the invention of uh, the pill. So you've got you know, new kind of sexual freedom. I mean, you've got some good things happening here, like equal pay for women. I mean, let me say I'm very in favor of that you know um, you've also got a, an increasing number of things like no-fault divorce laws which I don't know about America but in Australia the introduction of no-fault divorce led to a radical decline in female suicide okay so all sort of things like these are going on some of this is good but it also means we have a new profound sexual freedom and there is a sense in which people's identity could be bound up with their sexuality Okay, and, and this means you, you can even almost reduce yourself to the sum of your sexual desires. And I would even argue what we call identity uh, often is something like individual personality plus sexual desire. That's why you've got like 60 different gender identities on Facebook. Because you've got a mixture of sexual orientation plus personality. And then it gets even more complicated. You can add some um, uh, um, issues about ethnicity to there as well. And I mean, and this means that, that, that sex and sexuality has something become the most uh, important expression of what it means to be a human being. Uh, and as belief in God, or at least adherence to the traditional religious institutions such as the churches declined human beings were find, finding more fulfillment uh, not in spirituality but in sexuality and you could even argue that the sexual revolution has becoming something of a of a state religion uh, the english journalist malcolm uh, muggeridge he put it this he said if god is dead and that, that was a mantra from the 1960s if god is dead somebody is going to have to take his place it will be megalomania or erotomania the drive for power or the drive for pleasure the clenched fist or the phallus hitler or you hefner uh, we live in a new world where sexual expression, sexual desire is one of the most important things about what it means to be a human being. A fourth factor that we face is we now have post-liberal views of freedom in some quarters. Now, now, here's the irony. On the one hand, our culture has a strong sense of moral autonomy expressive individualism you know i should be able to get as many tattoos and as piercings as i like i should be able to dress however i like no one should be opposing their religious standards and duties and dogmas and doctrines upon myself but on the other hand people are saying but but some groups by their belief by their ideologies they're harming other people and they should be stopped so on the one hand we have this sort of you know, magnification, this hyper individualism, this idea that, you know, I must be who I am. It's like the, uh, the musical La Cage of Fall. I am what I am. I am my own special creation. Or to give a, another more recent musical from Hamilton, Aaron Burr gives a, a moment of, of, of postmodern philosophy when he says, I am an inimitable. I am an original. Okay, I am so different you can't even classify me. So we live in that type of an age, but if you say anything or imply anything that seems to cast aspersions on someone's unique identity, 
then there seems to be this call for censorship. Let, let, let me give you um, two examples of this. Um, in Australia, there was a rugby player. A rugby is like uh, you're a football, but just in inherently more entertaining. Um, it's funny because it's true. Uh, it's looking for an exit. Um, um, and he's a Tongan football player. He's very religious, and he was on Instagram, and someone asked him his thoughts about homosexuality, and he said he believed all gays were going to hell. Okay. Uh, now, I don't... I, I don't think he gave a very pastoral answer. I don't think, uh, I mean, something like that requires more of an essay rather than multiple choice answers, if you know what I mean. Some things are irreducibly complex. I would not have said what he said. But when he said that, a lot of people got very angry. A lot of people said they were hurt and he was accused of being homophobic and all sorts of things. And he was like, how can I put it? Like, uh, he was like the, the top running back, you know, the catchy guy. Um, in the Australian rugby team. And the Australian rugby, uh, under the pressure of the media and sponsors, terminated his contract. I mean, they had to pay him out a lot of money. And, you know, but they terminated his contract for something he said on social media. And I remember speaking to a friend of mine saying, I mean, well, do you think that's right that a company, you know, your employer can sack you for something you say on social media. Should, should, I mean, for me, this is not a religious freedom issue. I think this is an employment law issue. Does your, does your employer own your opinions on social media? Can your employer sack you for something you say on social media? And all of my progressive friends said, yes, undoubtedly, we like that. So then I told them another story. And now you, you definitely wouldn't have heard of this chap. His name is Brian Leach. Uh, he was a 50-year-old disabled grandfather who worked at Asda in the United Kingdom. Asda is kind of like Walmart, and he was kind of like a greeter. He greeted people as, as they entered the shop. Now, on Facebook, he shared a video of the Scottish comedian, Billy Colony, Col uh, Connolly, um, basically swearing and, and really going, you know, um, over the top, talking about, you know... F the, F the Catholics, all these, all these expletives about the Muslims, the Jews, the Protestants. He shared this sort of comical, um, you know, foul mouth rant by Billy Colony on Facebook. And one of his ASDA colleagues um, complained to the ASDA management. And as a result, a Brian Leach was terminated from ASDA. And this is, this, this is what I, I, I gave to my uh, progressive friends. I said, well, I understand you think uh, Israel Folau should have been sacked from his position as a rugby player, but do you think it was okay for Asda to sack Brian Leach for sharing an anti-religious comedy rant by a Scottish comedian? And they said to me, yes. And this led me really befuddled. Why, why would you do that? I mean, it, it struck me as very peculiar. And it, it, as I spoke to them, it came down to this. Look, I'm happy to lose my freedom of speech as long as that de deprives freedom to the people I don't like, which is a kind of we need to burn the village to save the village kind of mentality. I'm happy to have my civil rights taken away as long as they're also taken away from the people over there that I don't like. I mean, this is what I mean by living in a post-liberal society. But it's kind of weird because we've got hyper-individuality when it comes to self-expression. But on freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, people really do want a very bare minimalist approach. Now, I mean, there was a time when we would say, I reject what you say, but I will defend your right to say it. That, I think, is no longer the rule of the land. That's no longer, I think, the ethos of the younger generations. They're not thinking in terms of liberties that were won after centuries of, of tyranny and totalitarian chaos. I mean, this is a generation of kids who, who do not know what the Soviet Union was, who haven't met people who fled from Eastern Europe. Okay? So that, that's, one, that's another factor we're dealing with. The fifth factor has to be negative attitudes towards religion. The sad fact is when you turn on the news about religion, uh, you don't get great stories about Christians working to stop human trafficking. You don't get great stories 
about people's lives being changed by the gospel of Christ. You get things like terrorism, sexual abuse scandals, financial scandals, outright hypocrisy, nationalism, and those sorts of things. So our media, which is, by the way, not fabricating stuff, but they're pointing to some of the terrible things that happen in the name of religion. I mean, in that context, religion is going to be a kind of a hard sell. Uh, six, we can add to that, and this is something I think of the epicenter of the debates. We're living in a moment where there is a, a, a genuine, I think, cultural and legal rupture between LGBTI rights and religious freedom. Uh, the problem is, do Christian institutions, charities, colleges, uh, are they able legally or rightfully to discriminate against LGBTI people in their student recruitment, in their, in their hiring practices? And this is happening because we have t two genuinely good things. LGBTI rights, Now, which I believe, in a sense, are good rights. Uh, when I was in the army, I witnessed a group of my colleagues attack a gay couple for no reason other than being gay. I have seen homophobic violence. It is of the devil. We should always call it out, okay? But at the same time, and here's the debate, um, should a Christian school be forced to hire people who do not adhere to their, their beliefs and their principles? I mean, you might say, well, okay, for, for a French teacher, I mean, what's Christian about teaching French? French is French. There's nothing Christian about being to France. In fact, I've been to France. It's not very Christian at all. In fact, being a non-Christian might be an advantage in teaching French. Godless frog munchers that they are. So someone could say, well, you can't discriminate against, against a French teacher for being gay or Rastafarian or being an atheist because there's nothing Christian about teaching French. I mean, these are the sort of debates we're having. And the problem is, we, we, people want it to be one way. It's got to be everything goes on the LGBT side or everything goes in on the religious freedom side. But it's going to be a more complex discussion that we're going to have. Uh, we shouldn't use religion as a way of simply discriminating and marginalizing uh, sexual minorities. At the same time, I think forcing a Muslim school to hire a gay atheist is not really going to work out in the long run. But th these are the discussions we're having. So to, to sum this all up, um, it, will, it will make no sense to promote or protect religious freedom if it means diminishing people's sense of identity and self-expression. It makes no sense to promote or protect religious freedom if people feel harmed by your religious declarations. It will make no sense to promote or protect religious freedom if it continues to treat sexual minorities as other and denigrate them. It will make no sense to, pro to promote or protect religious freedom if it refuses to see sexual fulfillment as the highest ideal of human existence, which is one of the, uh, the extant beliefs. It will make no sense to promote or practice religious freedom if it means empowering Christian nationalism. It will make no sense in this culture to promote or protect religious freedom if it means unfairly discriminating against sexual minorities, women, or persons of color. So th that is what is going on, I think, largely in Western culture, from, from New Zealand to Norway. These are the types of issues, these are the type of seismic changes in our culture that we're wrestling with and trying to figure out how do we have religious freedom so we can maintain our, our ministries, our identity, the integrity of our Christian charities and schools without it becoming a big stick with which can be used against various minorities. And this is obviously playing out very differently in different jurisdictions. Now, I don't know whether you've heard, but there's a place in America called Colorado, and there was a particular cake decorator called Jack Phillips in the Masterpiece Cake Shop. At this point, can I assume everyone is familiar with the story? Since this is kind of in your backyard, I don't, I don't cut. It's like me explaining NFL to you. Okay, there's, there's a throwy guy, and then there's a blocky guy, and the running and catchy guy. Um, I'm, not, many of you know the story about how Jack refused to uh, decorate a cake uh, for a, a same-sex couple. Uh, and he, he won his decision in the Supreme Court for a number of reasons. Um, he had a good motto. He serves all people, 
irrespective of ethnicity or sexual orientation, but he does not do or art requested. He also refused to, to decorate a cake with a homophobic message, and he's also turned down some requests for uh, Bucks party cakes that were somewhat tawdry, uh, or even uh, Halloween cakes that were somewhat macabre. And he, that, that's why he won. He also didn't get a fair trial at the Colorado um, Civil Rights Commission that basically called him a Nazi, in effect. That, that's, that's why he won his case. Uh, but something you may not have heard of is the US Commission on Civil Rights. And they produced a document several years ago called Peaceful Coexistence, where they invited a number of parties to come together and to talk about how does religious freedom relate to the American system. And basically, the conclusion of the document was that religious freedom should be begrudgingly ex accepted, but religious freedom should be narrowed to the to the to the in the smallest possible way because religious freedom ultimately is nothing more than a license to discriminate. Okay, So this was a, 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 a US uh, commission that was defining religious freedom as it's got some good, but it's more dangerous than good. And, that, and that, that, I thought that was a very bad document and very concerning. Turning to my backyard, Australia, we have some similar things going on. In Queensland, uh, that's the state of Queensland. Queensland's kind of like the, cult, uh, the culture of um, Texas with the climate of Florida. That's kind of how I would, I would explain it. Um, but in Queensland, uh, a, a Christian school or a Muslim school cannot make being the, the principal or the provost or a member of faculty, they cannot make being a Christian or being a Muslim for the Muslims, a condition of being hired. The only person in the school who, who has to have a religious job description is the school chaplain. Because unless the position is exclusively a religious function, you cannot discriminate against people on the basis of their religion. So it means a Christian school cannot insist that the principal of the school has to be Christian. It means a Muslim charity cannot insist that the president of the charity has to be Muslim. Now, on the one hand, you can appreciate what they're trying to do, which is to vigorously prosecute a principle of non-discrimination, but it comes at the price of the religious integrity of religious organizations. Or to let me give you another example, again, from uh, my home state of Queensland, the, the gift that just keeps on giving. Uh, in 2008, there was a case of Walsh versus St. Vincent's de Paul Society. Okay, now th this this was a this, some of you, you know St. Vincent's de Paul. It's a, it's a Catholic charity. We we call it we call it Vinnie's in Australia. It's called Vinnie's. Um, so this was a Catholic charity, and they had one particular branch, and there was there was a, a woman there called Walsh, and she was a president of one of the chapters, and then it, it finally dawned on people that she was not Catholic. And so the authorities gave her the opportunity, either resign from your position or you should convert to Catholicism. And she declined. She took uh, St. Vincent de Paul to court and she won. And the reason she won is because the decision, <laughs> the decision of the court stated St. Vincent de Paul was not a religious organization. St. Vincent de Paul. Secondly, being Catholic was not intrinsic to the job description. And so, the, so the, 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 the state court found in the favor of Walsh. Now, as some commentators, and I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a legal genius, I've never practiced law, but if I did, I would have perfected it. <laughs> I had to, sorry, it's a Hamilton throw in. Um, I've never pra practiced law, but even I know this is a very odd law, or a very odd ruling, because it means government can now determine what is essential to a religion and which areas within an organization religion is allowed to matter in. And this is why I, I've sent some questions to our own um, uh, Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission, and I've asked them whether abstaining from pork is an essential aspect of Islam. If you apply to be the principal of a Muslim school, and you run a website called Bacon Lovers of Melbourne, can that school 
legally discriminate against you. And and this is the problem. It means government is now going to tell religious institutions what are the essentials and non-essentials of their religion. Now, once the government starts doing that, it's the end of secularism. Because secularism is not just about avoiding a theocracy. Secularism means the government does not interfere in your religion. And in order for secularism to work, the government must regard itself as incompetent to adjudicate in matters of religion. Or otherwise, we're going to have so much fun, we can ask the government, okay, consubstantiation, transubstantiation, Zwinglian memorialism, which one is essential to the Christian faith? Superlapsarian, sublapsarianism. I mean, think of the debates we could have with our government officials going through dictionaries. Oh, sublapsarianism. Is that, what is that? Is, is, I don't know, is, is, is that like schwammer or something? What is, I, don't, I mean, and this is, the, this is the problem that we're facing. Uh, let me give you an example, another one for me, which is the scariest one. The scariest one. If you look up on uh, the photo behind me on the right, there's a gentleman there by the name of Andrew Thorburn. Uh, He was the CEO of one of Australia's largest banks, the National Australia Bank. Uh, He left that job, and he was then offered the position as the CEO of the Essendon Football Club. Uh, That's the the other wrong type of football called AFL. I don't like that, so we don't have to worry. Uh, But he he was offered the job, but, but then the media found out he was the he was the chairman of the board of an evangelical church. And the media went through previous sermons of the church, and the the only two topics that the media was interested in was things about abortion and sexuality, and they found out that this church believed fairly traditional things about abortion, marriage, and sexuality. Uh, These sermons, ironically, were preached before Thorburn arrived at the church, and Thorburn said he did not necessarily agree with them. But the football club, Essendon Football Club, issued Thorburn with an ultimatum. Either resign from the board of his church or resign from his role as CEO of the football club. Now, let me just note something. He was the CEO of one of the largest banks in Australia, which had an inclusive hiring policy that were fully committed to inclusive hiring policies in the financial sector who obeyed the law and, and he was very happy to do that as a Christian CEO of a large financial institution. He was not like Israel Falau, who had tweeted, tweeted something insensitive. He did nothing wrong. He said nothing wrong, but purely on the basis of his affiliation of the church, he was given an ultimatum to resign. Uh, this was an attack clearly on freedom of association. And the funny thing is the the president of the football club was asked, well, why did you hire him? They said, why didn't you ask him about his religion in the job interview? And they said, well, we can't because it's illegal to do that. And then they said, but as soon as we found out about his religion, then we had to act to get rid of him. At at which case I can imagine that the the lawyers of the club going, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you just said that. Um, Now, I hope, um, I hope Andrew Thorburn Um, does take Essendon Football Club to court. I mean, he's fine. He's a millionaire. He's going to be okay. I'm worried about the next guy. I'm worried about the Muslim Uber driver. I'm I'm worried about the Jewish guy who who, who works in an accounting firm. I'm worried for the Christian who works for the state government. Because if we are allowed to sack people, terminate their employment on the basis of religious association... That is not a good place that we are going to. So so these are the challenges we're facing in Australia, in America, and you can see they are very similar. So what is to be done about this? Well, let me give you some things that should not be pursued. The solution, the solution to a a post-liberal society where there is, you know, the sexual revolution is effectively the new religion, or anything like that, the solution is not a political messiah, okay? Let's put all our eggs in one basket of a great political leader who will vanquish our enemies, who will stop our youth being corrupted with foreign influences like Bluey. 
I mean, talking dogs, it's got to be demonic. It has to be demonic, mustn't it? You know, you know, we need to make this nation great for God again. We need to bring back civil religion, prayer in schools, and all, all that sort of stuff. Now, I know some of these are complex topics. We can uh, celebrate and respect the Christian heritage of Australia and America that, that has brought us to our liberal democracy, okay? But a soft theocracy is not going to fix the problem. Okay. Similarly, when I talk about religious freedom, I'm not talking about returning to the good old days of the 1980s or the 1950s. Religious freedom is not Christian hegemony, just to be clear. Okay. I'm advocating religious freedom for everyone, for Christians, Jews, Muslims. Okay. It applies universally. It's not privilege for my particular religion. But there are a number of things we can do and we should support. First of all, uh, we need a positive statement of religious freedom. Part of the problem is that in Australia, and I think in the USA, religions, religious freedom as being defined principally as the right to discriminate against minorities. Now, yes, on the one hand, I think Christian institutions should, to a certain degree, be allowed to discriminate to maintain the identity and the integrity of their organization. But it's, but it's, but it's, not, a, it's not a blank check. Okay? So on the one hand, that is true. But I would say religious freedom is far more comprehensive and well-rounded that it includes far more than being pro or anti-discrimination law. This is, a, this is a statement from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and I think it gives a very good comprehensive definition of religious freedom. Let me give you its four points. Point number one, everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right shall include freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice, and freedom either individually or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching. Point two, no one shall be subject to coercion which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. Three, freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health, or morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. Number four, the state parties to the present covenant undertake to have respect for the liberty of parents and, when applicable, legal guardians to ensure the religious and moral education of their children in conformity with their own convictions. Uh, I submit to you that is a very well-rounded and wholesome definition of religious freedom and that, that is the type of thing I think we should be advocating in culture, in law, or every, proper, pro, uh, every opportunity we have to promote it. The second thing we need to remember is secularism is actually a good thing. Okay. Now, whenever I say this, people kind of look at me as if I've, I've just invited them to eat a cauliflowered flavored ice cream, you know, like, you know, or, or, or even just like offering someone. Vegemite, uh, which basically tastes like axle grease and salt. And like, but secularism and the bad guys, like, you know, like if I was living in a horror movie where a bunch of being Christian teenagers were being chased by a maniac with a chainsaw, the maniac's name would be secularism. Okay, Th that kind of a narrative. Now, I mean, and here's the funny thing I mean, people say, in my own country in Australia, people say to me when I talk about religious freedom, they say to me, like, but Australia is a secular country, uh, to which I always respond, no, Australia is a multicultural country with a secular government. And the secularity of government means we can be a multicultural country. It means we can be a land of all faiths and none because of the secularity of our government. And here's the other thing to, to remember, secularism is not one thing. There are about 20 or 30 different ways of being secular. The United Kingdom is, has its own version of secularism. Even though it has a, a king, King Charles, who's a Christian, with a Hindu prime minister, 
The Home Secretary is a Buddhist, the opposition leader is an agnostic, and the Mayor of London is a Muslim. So even though you have an official state church, you have a certain degree of secularity, which means people of all faith and none are able to participate in the politics of the nation. So that, I think that is a good version of secularism. But then you've got another version like, oh, I don't know, North Korea, where if the government sees you doing anything religious, they will arrest you or line you up against the wall and shoot you. Something like that. Or similar to China. China is not as bad as North Korea, but it's very brutal, repressive, and oppressive of all religious groups, including Christians, even the, the state church and the underground churches. And then there's the secularism of France, with what they have as laicite. Then you have the secularism of Turkey. Now, Turkey is an Islamic country, but by its constitution, it's officially secular. There's different ways of being secular. And what we have to differentiate are the more militant forms of secularism, okay, which want to, through a slow and gradual process, eliminate religion. Okay? So there are those militant versions of secularism, such as you found like in the Soviet Union, okay, where they want to grind down the, the obedience of people to their faith and their religion through all sorts of pressures and external controls. But there are good versions of secularism. And I would argue secularism, at its best, a, what we could call a generous secularism, is about creating space for people of all faith and none. And, and that's good because on the one hand, secularism means we don't want to live in a theocracy. But we've done that before. It does not end well. So it means we're not going to replace the president with a Archbishop of Canterbury, a Pope, a Dalai Lama, or, a, or an Ayatollah. We're not going to do that. Theocracy always ends bad, and it ends up with some, some kind of authoritarianism. Yes, you may not like Marxist or authoritarianism, but theocratic authoritarianism is just as bad. And the other side to secularism, the good side, is government doesn't tell you how to do your religion. They don't tell you who is qualified or how Catholic you have to be to be the president of a chapter of St. Vincent's de Paul's. Okay? The government regards itself as incompetent of matters of religion and refuses to coerce people in matters of religion. Uh, what we need in the end is what the uh, American legal philosopher John Inazu calls confident pluralism which mean we find ways, mechanisms, for managing differences within diversity. Okay, So it means you can end up with a situation where you will have something like a mosque okay, situated right beside an LGBT advocacy centre. And they're able to live next to each other in peace and harmony. They may not agree with each other. But it means when they see each other when crossing the street, there is no sectarian violence. There is nothing untoward. We learn to live at peace with each other. That's what confident pluralism is about. Managing differences within diversity. Finding ways to live with each other despite our differences. Those are the things that I think will enable us to uh, maintain our religious freedom in our current climate. So what we, need to, what we need to pray for is a balance of rights. No misinformation. We want a good secular, a generous secularism because that will create a liberal and pluralistic democracy. And we've got to remember that people have the right to hold unpopular opinions. People have the right to be different without fear of reprisal. People have the right to regard the state not as their ultimate power. People have the right to seek their own happiness to the extent it does not infringe upon the rights of others. And this applies universally for Anglicans, Baptists, Muslims, Mormons, people who are gay, bi, Jews, trans, or even those really weird esoteric religions like the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, I'm joking, Mormons aren't that weird. Uh, uh, let, me, let, me finish, let me finish this presentation by giving you a quote from the first president of the United States, George Washington. Uh, when the, uh, 
there were, there were many Jew Jewish refugees coming from Europe to the, Amer to the Americas to escape uh, persecution in Europe. So many Jews came to America to find freedom, to find a new way of life, attracted by the idea of the separation of, the ch of church and state and that people would have freedom of religion. And they sent a letter to George Washington um, telling him that they were, uh, you know, they, were, they, were, they were fanboys. I, know, I don't know what the Jewish word for fanboy is, but they were fans of him and they just wanted to know what his view of, of the Jewish people was. And this is what George Washington said. It would be inconsistent with the frankness of my character not to avow that I am pleased with your favorable opinion of my administration and fervent wishes for my felicity. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in the safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. That's from Micah 4.4. 4. May the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own June time and way everlastingly happy. But I love that line. What we should be advocating for is a, 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 a cultural arrangement, a legal settlement where everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree and none shall make them afraid. And in the words of the great American philosopher, Forrest Gump, that is all I have to say about that. Thank you very much. Clear, comprehensive, cheeky. You were forewarned. Uh, we'll open this up. We'll open it up to questions. Uh, Jason has a mic, so if you have a question, a burning question to stump uh, the distinguished Michael Bird, please just stand up. And Jason will run to you, maybe literally. There you go. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the examples you gave about um, social media and how they differentiate between speech acts and hate speech and how influencers can perpetuate words into action? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. The, the role of social media in a lot of these debates has been amazing. Um, like in the case of Andrew Thorburn, it was a mixture of media and social media just piling on the guy, calling from him to be sacked to the point that the Essendon Football Club felt that like they were cornered and they had no choice. Because um, if they retained him, they were going to get in trouble, but they knew if they kind of got rid of him, they are also going to be in trouble. So I think social media uh, is, is a, is a, has a big role in this as well. And I think social media is accenting the divisions we have in society. Um, in terms of like the ethics of speech and that type of thing, um, you know, like, I mean, I believe there are limits on, you know, free, free speech. You know, like if particularly if you're inciting hatred against someone or inciting or calling for violence, I would say that's the bar where I think your, your speech has gone too far. But we have reached the point where saying something that is not affirming or saying something that, that offends me is considered hate speech. And that's always baffled me. The Indian author, uh, Salman Rushdie, who was attacked, I think, at a, at a, at a literary event uh, several weeks ago, um, he, and he, he wrote a book that offended a lot of Muslims. I mean, there are some Iranians who, who are really out to get him. Um, and he, he, people said, well, you said offensive things, so like it's, 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 it's your own fault. I mean, you shouldn't have said those things. You were offending people. So it's your own fault for being so offensive. And Rushdie said, who told you you have the right not to be offended? And I think that's part of our culture. We think we have a right not to be offended. But the, some things, I mean... You know, I, I can go through Twitter or, or Facebook, and within about five minutes, I will find something offensive. You know, all you Americans criticizing Vegemite. Yeah, you know, I will find something offensive. So, so the problem is social media is is creating all these fissures, these dis disruptions, and these pylons in society. And very often, there's a very low bar for what counts as hate speech or harm. Does that answer your question? Well, do you, do you want to elaborate and I'll do my best? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, for those who don't know, Kanye, or as he called himself, Ye, has been saying things of a very anti-Semitic nature. Uh, and, and he's also been empowering things. Now, I, I think these things are terrible. Uh, we're not... We'd, I wouldn't... <laughs> It's a hard one. I mean, on, on the one hand, I'm very reluctant to do censorship, but on the other hand, I don't want to give the guy a platform. So, I mean, Twitter has a rules policy for what's acceptable speech, so if they want to take him off the platform, that makes perfect sense to me. But whether you want the US government to go around censoring people, that's, that's another issue, because and sadly there are some people out there who will say some very terrible things. Does that answer your question? Kanye doesn't have an employer per se. Like yep. in that, I mean, he did lose his contract with, um, I think it was Adidas over it, mm. when the government didn't get involved. That was de definitely like people opinion. Um, so if I am hearing you correctly, you're saying you want sort of companies like Twitter or individual businesses to be in charge of the censorship of their own platforms or their own users rather than governmental entities. Yeah, yes, at one level, yes. Okay. So I think, you know, if they have a rules policy, like you're not allowed to say anything that is uh, incites violence against other people, yeah, definitely. Uh, but the problem is some of those companies do not always um, uh, employ that language fairly. I mean, this is what baffles me. You know, uh, if you go on Twitter and if uh, you say something like, uh, I don't think trans women should be put in a female prison. Okay? You can get banned for that. But if you say, I hope J.K. Rowling gets murdered in front of her own children, that's fine. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things I've seen on Twitter. It's very uneven how they apply uh, the rules of the platform. And it kind of depends which way you swing politically. So I think if a platform has a list of rules that are applied across the board... That's fair because really you're using a product. This is the rule of the product, but it seems to be in Twitter it applies unfairly, you know. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a terribly big fan of Donald Trump. I understand why Twitter kind of banned him, but I also note the Taliban is still on Twitter. And whatever the failings there are of, um, of uh, President Trump, I do not think he is as bad as the Taliban. Okay, you can quote me on that. <laughs> Michael Bird says Donald Trump is bad, but he's not Taliban bad. <laughs> By the way, that is not an endorsement for his next run <laughs> for the White House, just, just to be clear. Uh, this is a different direction. I've been trying to think of how to ask this. So historically speaking, uh, how would you distinguish the uh, establishment of the U.S.? versus Australia and in their secular foundings yeah. based on um, maybe forced migration and voluntary migration and where we are now. Yeah, um, Australia was founded because Britain had a kind of problem child colony who got a little bit uppity. So um, that, that's why Australia was pretty founded. Um, yeah, I mean, well, Australia and America are really are parallel countries in many senses. And I would argue the Australian Constitution is effectively a British appropriation of the American system. I mean, that sounds pretty weird, but, but the Australia, we, we became a nation officially in 1901, and our Constitution was, imagine if you had a, a bunch of English people trying to imitate what the Americans did. Uh, that's pretty much what our constitution was, which is why section 100 and, and I think it's 116 of the Australian constitution about freedom of religion is very similar to the American First Amendment. So there are some v very big similarities between America and Australia on, on how they have wrestled with uh, religion in modernity. But the purpose was to avoid the sectarian violence the Protestant versus Catholics that had characterized Europe. They wanted to get away. So there are two, there are very clear similarities on that. 
I did read a very good PhD thesis by a chap called Damien uh, uh, Marl, who wrote a book comparing Australian and American secularisms. And he pointed out in America, the, the type of secularity you have is very much determined by local circumstances. So the secularity of Dallas is very different to the secularity of Boston. Okay, so your, your, your species of secularism is often more driven by the local context. In Australia, it tends to be a lot more top down from the federal government. Uh, and, and in fact, one of the problems we have in Australia at the moment is the Constitution says the federal government will not, you know, um, establish a religion or prohibit any free exercise of religion. But the states can do whatever the heck they like. And that's the problem we've had. The way we amend our constitution is not through Congress. We have to have a national plebiscite, a referendum, and it's got to get at least 60% of the vote. Twice, they've tried to amend the Australian constitution so that the non-establishment and the free exercise clause would apply to both the federal government and to the states, but twice it's been defeated. Uh, so, I mean, so that there are some very clear parallels between Australia and America, but there's also a slightly different way the secularity of the countries plays out. I like your continuum um, with good secularism and bad secularism. So, how do you help someone that you would identify holding bad secular ideas um, where they don't understand um, at best that the foundation of their being able to hold those ideas comes from religious freedom yeah. that gave birth to the space for pluralism. So, so how do you help them understand that they're actually becoming intolerant of the very ideas that were tolerant? Yeah. Well, and, and this is one thing I do is simply tell them the history of secularism. I mean, some people seem to think all the good values of the West were invented by the French Revolution. Okay, and this, this is where I tell them, you know, the French Revolution was based on the values of liberty. Uh, fraternity, okay, and equality. Okay, so they're the three values of the French Revolution. You know, cutting off the aristocrats' heads, liberty, equality, fraternity. And I ask people, in what year did the French revolutionaries set the slaves free in Haiti? In what year? Was it 1792, 1793, 1794? Who knows the answer? In what year did the French revolutionary government set the slaves free? It happened in the year never. They never did it. The Haitians launched their own successful revolt against the French revolutionary government and, and won their freedom that way. Okay? So the, the, the French proto-Marxist revolutionaries did not free the slaves. Who ended the slave trade? The happy, clappy evangelicals in Britain led by people like William Wilberforce. I mean, that's the story we've got to tell. How we got to secularism. And the other thing I tell my, 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 well, they're usually on the progressive side of the spectrum. I tell them, you've got to know some history. And I've got to tell you, any time you try to punish people because of their religion, they always push back. Okay? Wherever you go, all the way through to the Maccabean Revolt in the, in the second century BC, Professor Dodson can tell you all about that, all the way to the Cristera revolt in Mexico in the 1930s, where you have Catholic guerrillas attacking the government because of the persecution of the Catholic Church in Mexico. And I tell my progressive friends, if you're going to put your foot on somebody's throat, you've got to be willing to have your ankle bitten off. Because when you mess with people over their religion, they will not respond well. And that's over history. So what I tell my, my friends, they need a history lesson about the origins of secularism, the origins of our liberal values, okay, the origins of tolerance, which did not begin at the French Revolution. And I tell them that when you try to hurt people because you don't like their religion, it always ends badly. How does that work out? How does that work out? What's that say? 
Well, at the moment in Victoria, I'm losing. <laughs> it's not looking like, the, the, like Andrew Thorburn. He was sacked for his religious association. Um, but, you know, I'm in, I'm in Victoria. Victoria is so progressive, it makes California look like Alabama. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking. I mean, you know, that's what it's like being in Victoria. Um, and I, I'm, I'm doing, I, that's why I wrote my book, Religious Freedom. That's why I go around talking. Um, but we have some good organizations in Australia. We have um, uh, the Freedom for Faith Society. We have the Institute for, oh, not civil liberties. Uh, oh, there's another, there's, there's about three or four different religious freedom organizations that are out there, you know, writing articles in law journals who are arguing cases. And I'm pretty sure the Andrew Thorburn case will go to court. And I hope he's able to extract from Essendon Football Club a, uh, a statement that they broke the law. Uh, because if they don't, then that kind of behavior, that kind of intimidating, intimidation will become normalized. And you will, have, you will lose freedom of association. And it will become normal to sack somebody because of what religious organization they belong to. So I'm in the thick of the fight at the moment. And uh, I've been given a standing A count, but um, I'm like Rocky Balboa, but without the slurred speech. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for coming, Dr. Bird. I appreciate it and sharing. Um, curious, just your thoughts on like b being a Christian and your usage of, like, what are your thoughts on a Christian using social media do you have social media? How do you use it? Especially in light of everything you shared. Just, yeah, curious what you think. Uh, well, this bird does tweet. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was, that, that, that's the funny joke? That's the funny joke? I thought it was the Dallas Cowboys and the Don, but that was the funny joke? Okay. I should have kept it simple. I should have kept it simple. Um, yeah, I, I, do, I do use Twitter because I've got such all these amazing ideas and such a shame to keep them to myself. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, I've, had, I've, had, I've had tweet regrets, like, uh, on second thoughts. I shouldn't, oh, that's gonna, that, that one's coming back to bite me one day, yeah. Um, social media is like a tool, okay? Uh, and like all tools, it's open for abuse, use it responsibly. If it becomes a problem, get rid of it. Okay, um, and you've got to remember, social media is not. I mean, you know, things like Twitter, Facebook. It's not the re It's not real life. Okay, it's a manufactured digital world where you can project and be all sorts of things. And can I say, Facebook and Twitter is not the place to try change people's minds. Okay, you cannot get into debates. All you do is keep each other's disgust with each other fresh. But you can make friends, and you can put things out there for people to discuss. Okay, and if you, there are some people who can do that in a friendly manner, and there are those who are just inherently incapable. On the left and right, that door swings both ways. So, on the issue of, of religious institutions taking money from the government or the government giving money to them to do things that the government wants done, like take care of the homeless, various things like that. Um, how much right should the government have to control the, those religious institutions then because they simply took their money? Yeah. I, yeah, I think you can make a legitimate case. If you accept the government's money, then you, can, you have to do it on the government's terms. I, th I think that, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. restrict your religious freedom well no they don't have to restrict uh your religious freedom but you don't have to take money from them right, but they can give money to other people and not control them because they it's it kind of goes back to your point does a secular group have the right or the competency to have that conversation or should they be blind when it ignorant when it comes to that and they, if you, as long as you do what, that you do what you're the right thing with the money that you sold them, you're going to do like help the homeless. Yeah. You know why should they tell you who you can hire or who you can't hire? 
uh, because they can... I, okay, let me, let me back up and say this. When it comes to re religion and law, whether we like it or not, there are some laws that we have to obey. Let me give you an example. Things like um, occupational health and safety. Okay, you can't just allow you know, loose wires to be lying around. Things like um, fina uh, financial audits. The government can require that even faith-based institutions adhere to things like annual audit audits. So, uh, so there are certain government, you know, we can't say, well, I'll, you know, I'm not going to be audited because I believe in separation of church and state. Well, no, th this is those, that little blurriness. Now, where um, religious bodies, schools and charities receive government money, I do think if government wants to uh, apply conditions on how that money is used, or, or the, shall we say, the hiring policy or the inclusivity policy, that's within their prerogative. We're not under any obligation to accept the money from them. And if we want to say, well, fine, you do you and I'll do me, we'll, we'll raise our money some other way, but you know, he who, pay, who he pays the piper calls the tune. But what I find is most of the time, certainly in Australia, uh, where 23 of the largest 25 charities are faith-based, so our, our, our charity sector is dominated by religious organisations. Most of the time, government is willing to give, uh, give uh, money with usually the bare minimum of strings attached. Okay? So they'll basically say, you can, you, can, you can use this money, employ anyone you like, but don't break the law. Okay? And that just means they have to adhere to uh, workplace law. And in Australia, workplace laws generally do include certain exemptions from anti-discrimination law, okay? So uh, they, you could, they could say, uh, yeah, we insist that the chairman of St. Vincent's de Paul be Christian or the chairman of, of a Christian school. But that's the bit that's becoming more complicated in Australia. And certainly at the state of Queensland, it's very problematic in education, but that's not universal in every state of Australia. But, but generally, I'd say if, you know, if the government gives the money, then they can put strings attached if they like. As a follow-up to that, I mean, back under you know, George W. Bush and the Faith-Based Initiative Program, you know, he argued that you know, the government shouldn't be able to discriminate against Christian yep. groups or Muslim groups against them by not giving them the money and then, you know, but they can give it to secular groups. And he made a lot of progress with that. Yeah. And, and, um, and it was continued under Obama. Yeah, and that seems to be in some ways being pulled back a little bit at this point. And that's why I wondered if you had any thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah I mean, look, separation of church and state doesn't mean church and state cannot work together for a common good. And we see that through things like when the government funds chaplains in hospitals or chaplains in the military. Or when the government says, you know what, um, this church, this charity is a doing a really good job in preventing human trafficking. They're doing a really good job um, running an adoption agency. Okay, And basically, we're, we're willing to give you, give you money and we're allowing you to maintain your religious identity. But which is good, but there's going to be some points where they're going to make sure that money is not used to support things that they regard as inherently discriminatory. Now, th th there, is, there is some you know, grey stuff here. For example, we, I think it's in, what is it, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I think a Catholic adoption agency recently won a, a court case where they're allowed to not uh, send adopted children to, um, to, um, to LGBT couples. Okay, so I think that the the, the, is it the, I think it's the state court sided in their favour. But the government could well say, well, that's fine, we're not going to force you to do that, but we may not want to give you further funding if you, if you don't do that. That's government's prerogative. But here's the thing, government is ultimately responsible to the people, and the people can say, well, no, we do want the government giving money to Catholics irrespective of their view, or to the Muslims, or to a Jewish charity. Okay, it's, it, government does it, but government also has to please the people. And if the people are displeased with how it's dispensing money, then government will, will respond accordingly. So if you don't like what the government is doing on who it's giving money or not giving money to, then the way you affect that is how you vote. Uh, in your positive statement on uh, religious freedom, there's a nod to the fact that the government does have a role uh, with regard to public safety, health, etc. 
Uh, and I think we've seen uh, those areas expand over time. Uh, and as you've alluded to, it's a very blurry line, or it can be. So can you speak to yeah. how you unblur that line a little bit, uh, specifically maybe speaking to COVID mandates or uh, other kinds of things that were really hot topic issues in the past couple of years? Yeah, I'll be very happy to answer that question the moment someone hands me a bulletproof jacket. Um, yeah, COVID. I was in Melbourne, the most locked down city in the world. Okay, I, I, I know. If you, think, if you think you had it bad, we were the most locked down city in the world. We had it bad. Um, and yeah, and that was for all sorts of uh, uh, reasons as to what happened. During that time, we were not allowed to attend houses of worship. And when they did open up, there were specific requirements about space between us and wearing mask mandates. Uh, as per the, um, what I read from Article 3 of the International Covenant Civil Political Rights, that is a good example. Government can restrict religious freedom, but only as it is necessary. And you could argue it was necessary for short periods of time to restrict our ability to gather, uh, it was possible, it was necessary for short periods of time to insist on mask mandates and certain separation. But once, once that was no longer required, things went back to normal. So I was happy about that. But let me give, I'll give you one example where I was not happy. In Western Australia, which is kind of like the Australian version of Alaska, um, a, a policeman came to a Catholic church. He forced the priests to cease the service and he then checked everyone's vaccine certificate to make sure that everyone had been appropriately immunized. Uh, that uh, I considered an infring infringement of religious liberty because they weren't doing that down at the casinos, they weren't doing that down at the brothels, uh, they weren't doing that in the nightclubs. And if, you know, if I was, uh, I'm, I'm a priest, I'm not a Catholic priest, I'm an Anglican priest, but if a policeman said, I want you to stop the service so I can check everyone's you know, vaccine certificates, uh, my response would have been, uh, no, you can have checked them on the way in, or you can check them on the way out, but this is a house of worship, and the worship shall be going down. Uh, and I would have pol impolitely insisted that he take his oppression somewhere else. So, yeah, so, uh, so, but, but I would say that was unreasonable, because they were not doing any anywhere else, and there was an alternative. He, the policeman did not have to interrupt the worship service. He could have arrived early and checked people's you know, vaccine certificates on the way in, or he could wait till the end of the service and check them on the way out. So I thought that was, um, uh, I thought that was, uh, an, uh, it was an isolated incident, thankfully, but I thought that was an example of something that was not necessary. That there, if I can just finish on that, there actually is a document called the Syracuse Principles of Derogation, uh, Derogation which lists the, um, the principles on which some of the freedoms in that document can be um, limited. So, so, so international lawyers of human rights have already thought about this. Um, what is religious freedom? What are the limits to religious freedom? And what are the limits to the limits on religious freedom? Okay, but I don't want to get involved in a too technical discussion. I always say when people ask me the question of religion, freedom, and secularism, it was such a good question, why would you want to ruin it yeah. with an answer? And tonight you ruined the question. <laughs> so you mentioned Romans 13, arguably yeah. Paul's most political passage. Yeah. Revelation 13, arguably John's most political passage, yeah. although all of Revelation could be, but... I think one thing that may tie them together is Jesus' most political statement. If anyone must follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. Does it have a 13, though? <laughs> it doesn't. Well, we, we can make it that. No. In the Michael Bird Bible. Yeah, right. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Let me uh, end us in a time of prayer. O oh, Lord, O oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And Father, we pray that your will will be done, and that your kingdom will come, and God, that it will be here on earth as it is in heaven. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen.